Good afternoon, everyone. It's Thursday, March 25th, 12.01 p.m. And this is a joint meeting um, of Senate Agriculture, Senate Appropriations, Senate Natural Resources and Energy. And we may be joined by some colleagues from Senate Transportation. So uh, it's great to have us all together uh, because water is an interest to every committee. We all come to it through a little different lens, but the, the we have a shared interest in um, keep maintaining clean water, improving water quality in the state, and, and also in doing it in the most cost-effective ways. So you are really sort of eyes and ears for us out there in the world working on all this. And um, I'd love to have a, uh, a chance for all of us to hear your presentation. Um, there are a lot of us, so rather than pause and have introductions all the way around, we'll use up 10% of our time doing that. Uh, just, uh, I think we've, most all of us have met in the past. So let's just jump right in and um, turn to um, today's MC on your side, uh, Mr. Wenberg, good to see you again. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, for the record, I'm Jeff Wenberg. I'm the former, recent former commissioner of public works for the city of Rutland here uh, as a member of the Citizens Advisory Committee on the Future of Lake Champlain. We have several committee members also here who are going to keep me out of trouble, hopefully, with all the committees. Uh, Lori Fisher, who is a former chair and uh, uh, I'm almost like member emeritus. I don't know if you're there for her. <laughs> Hillary Solomon, who, like me, hails from Southern Vermont. Mark Nod, who's the current chair, and uh, uh, lives in Grand Isle. He's an attorney. And there may be <clears throat> one or more also uh, joining us later. And I uh, encourage if it if the chair would indulge um, the members to jump in. One of the things about this committee is the various members have different um, perspectives and expertise, and they bring a lot to the table. There are 10 citizen members of the committee, which was uh, formed by a legislative uh, act in 1988. It first met in 1989. And it works through a memorandum of understanding with uh, uh, committees of similar um, makeup for uh, the state of New York and the province of Quebec. So it is very much focused on Lake Champlain and the basin that supports it. And um, I have been asked to sort of uh, begin the um, presentation here. Now you should have all um, received electronically uh, this document, which is uh, and I will, and I'll put that up on the screen share in a, in a moment, uh, which is our uh, 2021 action plan. Um, our charter uh, uh, empowers us, or more to the point, uh, uh, charges us with the responsibility of um, researching the current and uh, current situation and uh, water quality concerns. Um, habitat concerns and also, you know, economic concerns for um, the lake and the tributaries that feed to it from the state of Vermont. And we meet um, typically about once a month. This last year, that was uh, reduced uh, significantly because of COVID, um, but we've resumed that uh, as well. And we receive lots of briefings and information from various experts, um, both within the administration uh, here in the state of Vermont, but also from others, um, uh, various uh, NGOs, um, federal officials, that kind of thing. Um, and, and, and the Lake Champlain, you know, of, of course, basin program very much. Um, we also take a comment as you folks do from uh, members of the public and get a lot of feedback uh, regarding, you know, public concerns for uh, the state of the lake and where things seem to be headed. So hopefully we will be a useful resource for uh, your efforts to, like ours, to improve uh, water quality uh, in Lake Champlain. Now, if I could uh, just do this share screen and... Hope everybody can see that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. So our um, our action plan is summarized by the bold face on the uh, on the front page. It's just two pages, and we try to keep it really to the point. And we have six 
areas that we are uh, encouraging uh, focus, action, investment, or whatever on uh, going forward. Um, the, the main thing that we've been advocating for years and years and years is adequate funding um, to support uh, various activities uh, relative to water quality in Lake Champlain. Of course, right up front is the uh, phosphorus TMDL, the restoration plan. Um, of course, the legislature has very much stepped up to the plate on that, and there are uh, adva advancing opportunities to um, federal funding to COVID and potentially infrastructure uh, funding that could be coming in a relatively near future. And obviously uh, want to encourage looking at these issues and challenges as part of the state's uh, response, which the governor is already doing in some respects in his budget. Um, to get into the specific um, areas of uh, recommendation of priority areas, um, I'll just go through them. I'll summarize. I'm not going to read them because you've got them. But investment in natural and developed infrastructure, um, this goes along very much with the restoration plan. Um, it, it connects the issues of uh, ecosystem restoration and wetlands restoration, uh, floodplain restoration with uh, uh, climate change. And uh, you know, there is a direct connection between uh, carbon sequestration and, and those things. But we also uh, need to focus very much on, and this is kind of my thing, I'll let the other members of the committee focus on the, their areas of uh, specific uh, expertise. But one of the main um, issues that unmet challenges um, that is uh, challenging us relative to phosphorus is urban lands and the um, stormwater runoff relative to uh, streets, sidewalks, urban uh, lands, and the phosphorus contribution to the lake there is dramatically more than it is from wastewater treatment plants or many of the other sectors. Um, agriculture and urban lands really are um, very, very big. We'll get to agriculture in a minute. But um, there, there is going to need to be a substantially more public and private investment in uh, dealing with stormwater runoff from uh, developed areas if we are going to meet the targets on the TMDL. Um, adding to this challenge, of course, is the situation uh, with the three acre rule, which um, there is has been some relief provided, limited for municipalities and also ex access to uh, public financing for um, private uh, property owners that need to do this. But, basically because of the impact on the business community through COVID and the fact that the uh, agency is a former DEC commissioner, I think I can say this, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation um, has underestimated the uh, uh, typical cost of uh, meeting these uh, current requirements for stormwater treatment um, that a, a great many private and nonprofit and even some municipal um, challenges are not going to be met uh, without additional uh, financial assistance uh, coming from outside. And I wanna bring a lot of attention to that because quite frankly, the three acre rule is necessary to meet the uh, Lake Champlain TMDL. It is the next necessary step, but it will fail um, if uh, there isn't substantial assistance that is going to be available to businesses that don't, you know, it's certainly not good for anybody if the business has to make a decision between um, essentially closing its doors because it can't afford the investment uh, required. Uh, that does not improve water quality and it certainly doesn't help the economy in the state locally or at the state level. So um, we can give some specific examples of, of uh, things we've heard about that, but that's, that's my little sermon on that. Um, Can I respond to your sermon just very briefly? Yes, yes please. Senate, Senate Natural had the congressional delegation in this morning, and I'm, I'm sure the whole Senate will be working uh, with the uh, American Recovery Program, et cetera. But um, it seems as though there's some promising uh, information in what's in the earliest notice about the uh, availability of federal funds for exactly these sorts of projects. 
Um, the challenge is the Treasury, which has to define the precise rules, has 60 days to do so. So we might not see precise rules until close to our uh, typical adjournment date. So, uh, so the work to be done, but uh, for the maybe once in a decade or generation, there could be significant funds available. And, and that is the best news possible because there are a number of items on our um, action plan um, that could be either accelerated or become more, more successful um, if uh, we were able to apply some of those funds. I know that the demand is gonna be enormous, but some of those funds to the needs that we identify here. So that's wonderful, timely news. The next one is investment in public access and the recreation economy. This is an item we've had on our action plan for a number of years. Um, basically, this, this serves multiple purposes. Obviously, there's an economic benefit if uh, uh, more and more people have the ability to access the, the lake and the waters feeding the lake uh, without having to own property adjacent to it. Um, we believe pretty strongly that this, we are, this is an underserved need. And in fact, during this last summer, which was very favorable weather, but uh, also drove an awful lot of folks to um, want to do outdoor recreation uh, in Vermont because of the COVID restrictions and you know, the limitations in travel and also on indoor activities. So um, I believe we saw about a 50% increase in the uh, demand or the activity and use of our waterways. That's wonderful, wonderful news because the reality is people value what they know and what they experience. And the more Vermonters, especially younger Vermonters, who have the opportunity to experience and enjoy the natural environment, specifically Lake Champlain and, and our waterways, they will value it more because of those experiences, especially as, and that was true for me, as, as a young person. And so that is really an investment in the future um, kind of political um, constituency that will be needed to sustain these efforts going forward. So it's, it's an immediate economic thing. It is a long-term um, sustainability, if you will, from the standpoint of, of keeping these priorities uh, in front of Vermonters current and future. And it's also a crying need that we have, especially in the area of the South Lake where the limit, there are very limited um, opportunities compared to some other regions for public access to the waters. Um, they, oops, didn't know I could do that. The third one is um, aquatic invasive species prevention need support. This is another one that is a continuation we saw, there's the 50% uh, uh, statistic in this one, that boat launches saw a 50% increase in use this last year. Um, we know that the lake is constantly being threatened by new invasive species, um, which can change the whole ecosystem and the economics in some cases uh, of uh, businesses that depend upon recreation on the lake. Uh, fortunately, the lake, uh, notwithstanding its hydraulic connections to uh, the Hudson Canal and the Hudson River and also to uh, the Great Lakes, uh, is cleaner from a standpoint of invasive species. I believe Lori stated in uh, a previous one of these that we have about a fourth of the uh, uh, invasive species as are typical in the Great Lakes and about half of those uh, in the Hudson River. So while we are hydraulically connected and we have concern for the fact that they're out there and they can come in, uh, we have done a reasonably good job. We need to keep this up, especially looking at boat launch facilities uh, where volunteers are doing wonderful work, but those are in limited areas and um, they have limited resources. Um, these lake associations have limited resources. An ounce of prevention is worth multiple tons of cure on when it comes to uh, preventing invasive species from becoming established in our waterways. And I, I don't think any more needs to be said about the importance of that, um, but it, it's one that we have uh, continued to support. 
I have a question um, for Jeff. This is Jane Kitchell. Um, I have a, a question. Um, it's just more of informational. <clears throat> um, I know Lake Maury, which is in my Senate district, there's a very strong Lake Maury Protective Association, and they actually have played a very um, important role in uh, partnership and uh, on funding. Some of the, and one of the big challenges, of course, has been um, it Milfoil, which was taking over the lake. Is there a comparable organization for Lake Champlain? I realize it's such a large body of water compared to others, but um, are there uh, organizations, um, I, I realize every, a lot of what we're saying is the state must do this, the state, you know, that we need more money. Um, but my question really gets to um, whether there are uh, partnership organizations that exist um, maybe for different sections of the lake. Yes, uh, I'm gonna defer to Lori Fisher. Is she is the expert on that, but my understanding is there are organizations in separate in several several organizations uh, along the lake in separate areas. But go ahead, Lori. Yeah, thank you, uh, and thank you for that question, Senator Kitchell. Um, I um, direct the Lake Champlain Committee. We're a regional watershed by state organization that focuses on water protection on and uh, a healthy ecosystem. So we certainly have gotten involved in those same programs on Lake Champlain. Lake Champlain also has a, um, a successful and ongoing program for water chestnut harvesting um, in the South Lake. And um, that's a public private partnership with state funds. The Lake Champlain Basin Program, which Jeff mentioned before, which uh, coordinates efforts to uh, reduce pollution and implement the Lake Champlain Restoration Plan has since, to, I believe 2007, had a boat steward program running on Lake Champlain where there's educational information going out at all the major uh, boat access sites on Lake Champlain. And there, uh, last year, there were washing statement stations set up in the North Lake. Uh, there's a lot of coordination, particularly on Lake Champlain, uh, on these issues of aquatic invasive species, not only in our region, but also key people sit on national task forces uh, focused on, you know, everything for um, uh, how do you manage and how do you prevent species and get that information out. And the focus really on Lake Champlain is very much on keeping additional species out. We have 51 right now and keeping the ones that are here and limited to Lake Champlain from spreading into other inland waterways like Lake Maury. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, the next item is investment in agricultural transition to sustainability. Um, we have the uh, you know, Chairman Starr and members of the Agriculture Committee are on here, far more expert in this than, uh, than I am. I believe Mark Nod is on and he, uh, we do, actually, er Eric Clifford is a uh, member of the committee. I don't believe he's on today, but he is, uh, brings an awful lot of expertise in uh, the state and uh, challenges facing uh, farmers in Vermont to uh, the rest of us who are uh, not nearly as knowledgeable about that. The committee's um, recommendation in this regard is for the Agency of Agriculture, Farm and Markets to, um, continue to provide dairy farmers with better access to alternative models of agriculture, uh, more profitable for them, uh, and also uh, uh, better from a standpoint of uh, ecosystem protection and, and water quality protection. And this is there's a transition underway. It's being driven largely by economic forces beyond the control of anybody in Vermont. Um, and there is potentially an opportunity as much as this is very much a crisis for agriculture in Vermont, there is nonetheless an opportunity to try to save as much of the um, economic sector that we have in Vermont by transitioning to um, other models, more sustainable models, uh, more profitable uh, models. And there has been quite a bit of that going on um, but we don't see that the circumstances that we face today are gonna change any time in the immediate future. And that there, it continues to be, notwithstanding the amazing progress that the agricultural community and the farmers in this state have done 
to reduce phosphorus loading to the lake. And that should not go unstated and unrecognized. Um, but the, uh, the, the, nonetheless, it's a heavy lift and more progress is going to be needed. And this is one way to support um, this ongoing transition in agriculture and at the same time uh, benefit the environment um, uh, you know, by working these things together. So we wanna work with that. I, I don't know if anybody wants to amplify that. I think Mark just joined. Um, okay. Yeah, and Jeff, this is Bobby. Um, you know, we, we have been working um, uh, in the committee, but uh, also in approach, we approved uh, money for ecosystems enhancement through the agency, uh, put extra money in to expand and update and upgrade our slaughtering facilities. Um, and working to, um, we're also working on uh, trying to get better pricing for our dairy milk, um, but the goat uh, farming has been expanding uh, with Vermont Creamery, um, and that that's really just getting going uh, with a new farm coming online with, uh, I guess, about a thousand additional or more goats. So we're, we're working in that direction, and uh, you know, hemp, we put quite a lot of effort into that, even though it hasn't panned out too well yet. Uh, but uh, we're still working to enhance that marketing business. Uh, so we're, we're working along, uh, you know, hearing a lot from, from uh, farmers as well as uh, people uh, that deal with water quality and A&R. And, &R and uh, I think I think we're on the same page. Um, it's just uh, transitioning over. It's, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Um, the next one is the uh, recommendation of the committee, which may generate some questions. It did the last time I did this. Um, to uh, basically uh, e remove or uh, discontinue the memorandum of understanding between the Agency of Agriculture, uh, Farms and Markets to, and the Agency of Natural Resources, Department of Environmental Conservation regarding the enforcement activity for um, uh, water runoff for uh, basically uh, point source pollution um, from uh, agriculture. It is the view of the committee that the uh, relationship between the two agencies has not resulted in the desired um, coordination, uh, that the effect of it has been um, insufficient enforcement, um, bad public uh, relations, which may in fact be uh, overstated and amplified um, in the media. In other words, it may not actually reflect what's going on, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's been an issue. And also the, uh, the farmers themselves find as we are hearing that they are getting caught in the middle of uh, agencies that have shared responsibility for this and uh, too often kind of point at the other guy. And meanwhile, uh, illicit discharges take place or no actions taking place. It's our view that the Agency of Agriculture is exceptionally good and well-suited at doing what we just spoke about, which is this transition. They're exceptionally good about providing technical assistance and achieving compliance, achieving compliance on farms. Um, that's essentially what they do with great success. Um, however, when that doesn't result in compliance, notwithstanding all of those efforts, um, there needs to be an enforcement follow through. And the current MOU has not functioned to actually get effectively or consistently to that last step. Um, it's our view and as a former DEC commissioner, I can speak to this, that that's DEC's bail bailiwick 
is that enforcement. Um, if they're not doing it or not doing it adequately, they should be held directly responsible for the um, lack of effective enforcement. And it should not be a situation where the, the, uh, the, the regulated entity is being whipsawed back and forth between two agencies, which we believe is, has been happening. Um, the chairman, Mark Nod, can speak to the specifics of that as well, if there are any questions on that one. Yeah, well, we should get to the bottom of that because, you know, we're putting a lot, we as legislators and in, in groups, are, we're putting a lot of money into trying to clean up our our uh, point source uh, pollutions and, and all of our uh, pollutions. And if we've got a couple of agencies that aren't adhering to um, their end of the bargain, I mean, we should know about that and, and call them in. And in a group meeting, you know, both of them at the same time and, and deal with that because it's not, certainly not our intentions to allow that to continue. Okay. If I'll just move to the last section and then I'll open it up for other comments or questions. The last section, the last recommendation is the next generation toxic pollution. Uh, there are two basic concerns here. The first is um, our database, the state's database, or it's the information that it collects on the use of ca agricultural chemicals and other contaminants that are spread on the land, uh, you know, at, at homes, uh, golf courses, uh, and, and at farms and so forth, has been minimal. So we really don't have a, a good handle on uh, what is coming in and where it's going and uh, you know, what, to what degree it's being, it's being used. We have some information, but um, when we try to drill down on this stuff, uh, we run into um, data quality concerns uh, regarding the base information of what's going on. We are very concerned, and Lori can speak to this one if there's any questions. We're very, very concerned about this next generation of contaminants. Um, uh, I'm going to put my former DEC hat on for a minute. The, the, Two statements. Number one, the Federal Clean Water Act is arguably the most successful um, environmental legislation in the history of the United States. And I think I can defend that statement um, till the cows come home, so to speak. TSCA, the, the uh, federal law concerning uh, um, uh, pesticides and those kinds of, of contaminants, uh, hazardous chemicals and so forth, has not been uh, as successful. Uh, and there are a lot of problems. And so all manner of new chemicals are being developed by industry all the time, most of them wonderful, providing great benefits, but not terribly well understood. And they're going out into the marketplace and they're going out into the market. And we're finding out sometimes years later of the long-term at the very least consequences or effects of some of these. These things and PFAS is kind of the poster child for this argument now, but there's much, much more than that. Um, these things are now becoming ubiquitous, not only in our bloodstreams, but in the environment. And now we're raising, uh, raising concerns for long-term public health concerns or environmental concerns. Um, so we, we think we need to raise the awareness of this and try as much as Vermont can to get a handle on what's being used and what we know about it, so that if there's a need to uh, regulate or to control um, or to better research the effect of some of these new contaminants and chemicals that are getting more and more used, um, that we get ahead of it rather than react to it after it becomes ubiquitous and across the board in our waterways and, and elsewhere. So that's a nutshell on, on that last bullet. Um. Uh, Mr. Weinberg, on that last bullet, if you could, if we could follow up maybe after the meeting and, and learn more about the kind of the granularity of, of the information that you believe would be helpful, that would be good for us. I know that we've been working with DEC. We share your concern and frustration over PFAS, for instance. So we have very protective levels on five, but it's a family of 5,000. And what we asked uh, 
well, yeah, we say ask. We, we're always polite. We ask the DEC to start formulating rules, if possible, to regulate by class or at least subclass so that we're not, uh, you know, 4,995 chemicals behind and just trying to catch up. Um, and um, so Vermont is partnered with other states on that. And I think we're actually sort of on the leading edge of figuring it out. But you're right, uh, TASCA, Toxic Substance Control Act, is it's one of its first provisions was to grandfather in 59,000 chemicals currently in commerce at that point in time. And uh, it, it has not been, it's not oriented to being protective. It's oriented to, to letting chemicals into commerce. Right, and it's, it's, it forces regulators to be reactive. And we're basically advocating to try to do exactly what, Mr. Chairman, you just described, which is to be more proactive. Lori, uh, can you speak to the, uh, what, some of the specifics that we learned just to give a, a sense of um, the concerns that we have regarding at least the data? Um, sure, and thank you, Jeff, and thank you, committee members, for this time. Uh, as part, as, as Jeff noted, as part of our due diligence to uh, uh, develop the action plan every year, we are, uh, am I still here? I just yes. to, yep. okay. My yes. screen just switched, okay. Um, so as part of our due diligence, we uh, get presentations from area experts, et cetera, and one presentation was from Nat Shambaugh, former chemist at the, um, and the agricultural agency since retired, but who has been doing uh, work for the Lake Champlain Basin Program to further uh, review some of these issues. And one of the issues he brought out was uh, the increase dramatically in the use of both glyphosate and atrazine, uh, you know, uh, you, they're associated with agriculture and um, the uh, glyphosate, which is I think commonly known as Roundup, that increased dramatically um, and was supposed to decrease the amount of atrazine when in point of fact that didn't happen. And also what came out of that testimony is that there's poor tracking of the uh, just the amount of use and the sales that we don't have good data and tracking associated with that. So one of the recommendations, nor do we have a really good understanding of, we're not monitoring in our water systems for those. So one of the things our uh, committee made a recommendation that as part of the ongoing long-term monitoring, the state and the Lake Champlain Basin Program look at uh, identifying opportunities to gather more information on herbicides and pesticide use as part of either the long-term monitoring program or separate from that. And our chair, Mark Nod, has been advancing that through the various channels with the Lake Champlain Basin Program. I think you know, we don't have a definitive uh, answer on what they're going to do, but I think it next will go before their technical advisory committee. And we're hoping that there will be some gains there. And so that's one of the things we tried to outline in this. We need a better process for really tracking um, what the chemical use is, what the sales are, and also why these are going up when we have a pesticide advisory council whose mission um, and both agencies have a mission of toxic reduction. Why are we seeing these increases? Um, Ms. Fisher, so uh, you know, sometimes I think we've talked about phosphorus as the, uh, a proxy for many other things. So it's mm -hmm. benign, but when it's um, when emitted in too high a level, we get algae blooms. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a little hard for me to imagine, but I haven't seen the science behind it. So I guess that's what we're looking for. If phosphorus is moving, what else is moving with it? I guess is the question. And does that include pesticides or herbicides, things that are uh, atrazine? For instance? I don't know yeah. if you have data on that or it's just, you know, seems like a prudent question to ask and then to begin testing for. Uh, yeah. Um, Go ahead. Laura, I, mm -hmm. I think with some of the work and, and following the resolution that the Vermont Citizens Advisory Committee put forward to the executive and steering committees at the Basin Program, 
stemmed from uh, presentations we heard, not, from, not just from Nat, but also from Kerry Guerre at the Agency of Agriculture regarding the monitoring and sampling and the database management that the agency does. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that was presented and I think went to this assumption that with the increased use of cover cropping for ag practices, that we would see a reduction in the use of defoliants, atrazine and glyphosate or Roundup. And what they, what it's shown is not just in agriculture, but in forestry and then uh, and also rights of way, um, there's been a dramatic increase and not a reduction in either, but a huge increase in, in Roundup as that Roundup ready planting and uh, defoliant herbicide application increased throughout the country, not just in Vermont, actually throughout the world. Um, we also saw an increase in use of atrazine, which had been trending down. And so that caused some alarm. And when I presented it to um, the executive and steering committees and our federal partners there, I believe like many, the assumption was that <laughs> with cover crops, which have been a huge part of the reduction of phosphorus loading from the agricultural sector all over the country. Um, and particularly that's the applause in Vermont for the work we've made towards uh, solving some of the challenges with the TMDL. I think the assumption was there would be a concurrent reduction in use in chemicals. And actually what happens is that uh, while extension, UVM extension and others are working on mechanical solutions, crimping of the cover crops as they grow in order to uh, stop their growth and release whatever is being planted, whether it's typically corn, but whatever the crop that might be planted on those fields, um, it needs to be released. And defoliants, herbicides have been the tool of choice. Um, and so there's some concern because we're not doing good edge of field or monitoring and sampling in our water bodies for what that chemical cocktail might actually represent, let alone what the health or human impacts of those. We know the atrazine has some challenges. Glyphosate science is still out there on whether there's long-term negative human health impacts. Um, it is recommended not to be sprayed adjacent waterways and yet it's finding its way in. There is a USGS um, uh, uh, plan, I think it will be implemented this summer to do some analysis and uh, also seeking some additional funding to see where the neonicotinoids, which is another class of chemicals that we understand have significant negative impacts on our pollinators particularly, um, to try to address what's making its way into the water with these change in practices. So I guess to answer your question, while we did see good P load reduction, the chemical contributions while we've reduced P loads are poorly understood and uh, the database is, uh, is not well managed. So that's what we've asked for both from the state and from our, uh, our partners at the basin program. Well, great. We should. I think the committee, and I suspect the Ag Committee too, would be interested in, you know, we're, we're always trying to get better data in order to make an informed decision. So, well, let's schedule to follow up and learn more after today. Thanks. And, and uh, Jeff, if I may, um, you know, we've heard testimony that the um, Pesticide Advisory Board really wasn't meeting in proper sequences. Um, the board was too large uh, to really work well together. And <clears throat> we're working um, on putting together a new, uh, I guess you'd say more with more expertise in the areas of chemicals and, and the new chemicals. That, and we would call that the um, innovative uh, Agricultural Innovative Board. And it would be made up of a smaller number of people, but with more technical expertise to um, recommend, you know, different chemicals to the agency that 
could should be used and shouldn't be used. And um, we took testimony earlier this week and have more scheduled uh, for next week. And probably we'll be working with uh, Chris uh, and his committee in natural resources on, uh, you know, formulating that group. But we had the Secretary of Natural Resources in yesterday to give us, uh, you know, her point of view. And, and so we're, we're moving forward. Hopefully we'll do better. That sounds like it's very consistent with that last number six recommendation that the committee's made. So thank you so much, Senator. Great. So I'm just looking at the clock. We all have the floor in about 20 minutes. And I, I know that some people <laughs> came right from another committee meeting. So I'm trying to make sure we break with enough time for people to grab a sandwich between meetings. Um, are, uh, are, is there anything we haven't covered in the meeting so far that um, you all wanted to make sure we heard about during your visit? Uh, I'd leave it up to the other members of the advisory committee to chime in if they uh, want to add something. Okay. Ray, did you, were you able to say all the, all the, oh, Laurie, did you get everything that you wanted to say? I, I had a quick something, but I wanted to make sure you had, had enough time. But you're you're muted. Go ahead first, Hillary, and I see Mark is raising his hand, so I'll go after oh, well, you. I'll if go, there's why still don't time. I go if there's time? Because yeah. um, well, I want to let you, let you guys go, and I'll go if there's time. Hell, I just want to wrap up and thank the the committees for allowing us to present this. We we look forward to any follow up you might um, desire from us. Um, we come to you every year with priorities. Um, I think that the committee uh, consensus was that we're at a unique time with our opportunities for our COVID response funding that might be flowing through and additional funding flowing through the administration and our all-star congressional delegation to um, look at the allocation of those funds and the policies that might be supported. Um, with the lens of the priorities that we've presented. They're long-term investments necessary for a high quality environment that's so critical to um, the long-term economy, uh, the health of Vermonters and beyond. And, and COVID has spotlighted some of these issues and maybe amplified the urgency of how we might be addressing them. We know we have a, a whole suite of issues and lots of demands for limited resources, but um, consensus is that a healthy Lake Champlain watershed is a winning investment every single time. And um, there's opportunities to jump on, on that now. Okay. Um, before we go to Senator Sears, just a quick to follow up on that remark. Um, although it's committees of uh, the appropriations that we'll be looking at the budget in the end, um, committees of jurisdiction often make recommendations over. Do you have any documents that tie together you, these high level goals, which I, I'm pretty confident everyone in this meeting supports and yeah. the particular programs and funding levels that exist now and that you might propose any increases for? If you could connect the two, that would be helpful, I think, for everyone who's here. Uh, we'll we'll do what we can with the materials that we have, and then with um, you know developing that consensus from the committee. Okay, great, uh, Senator you. Sears. Yeah, I, I do. I'm sorry I missed part of the meeting. I had another meeting at noontime today, um, and if this subject was already taken up, um, that's fine. You can let me know off offline. I want to know if the polluters who cause the damage to Lake Champlain are being held accountable before we spend taxpayer money. Um, and some of those uh, funds that Senator Bray was just talking about uh, on the cleanup of Lake Champlain. I, did, I have get this feeling that the polluters have not been held accountable, that they have um, scaled away. And I, I really need to know how we're doing on that. Uh, thanks, Senator Sears. Um, I think 
we, as a committee, we've discussed, and I think our most re prior years, um, we specifically addressed a polluter pays principle needs to be reinforced um, in all of our policies in the state of Vermont. I, it was either last year's or possibly the year before, as I think we used that language. Um, I, I can't speak for the entire committee in my perspective as an environmental attorney and land use attorney. Um, in general, the polluter pays principle has not worked around the country, let alone in the state of Vermont. Um, that, and, and we hear from committees and membership that we have to make trade-offs and that the trade-offs are, we don't have the resources to provide sufficient enforcement or we have policies that limit enforcement, or as Jeff noted, we don't have the resources to, to the three acre permit rule that Jeff discussed earlier is the next level as we're sort of ratcheting down on polluter pays. We just don't have the resources to support them even figuring out what are the best engineered solutions to catch up with our updated regulations and our better understanding of what their impacts are. So, so let me give you a little genesis of my question. Right? I live in North Pennington, Vermont. I live on contaminated property now by St. Gobain Plastics Company. Right. Um, we're trying to do our best to hold them accountable. Um, they've already ponied up quite a bit of money, but I see us with this huge bill to clean up Lake Champlain and those that polluted it getting away scot-free and it doesn't seem right to me. And I, I'm gonna have a hard time um, throwing money until I see some results from the effort. I realize it's not easy. I realize that it's difficult and that the business interests are always fighting to make the taxpayer or the individual who was contaminated pay for the pollution. But it's got to stop somewhere. And I say it's, it's time to stop it. Um, and I, I just uh, feel so upset to hear that we're going to plow millions more of the federal relief funds into Lake Champlain when we're not getting money from the polluter. This doesn't solve my problem. Uh, That's just thanks. my final comment. I appreciate, you know, you all taking the time. And as Senator Bray said, we have to get to the floor. But I, I'm going to be eyeing that as part of the cleanup effort. Uh, Senator Bray, thanks, Senator Sears. If you might give me 30 seconds just to give a, a sort of broad sure, let's, response let's to that. Sure, let's do one, one last question or comment, and then I think we do need to politely excuse ourselves and head to the floor. Um, so what we've learned as we studied Lake Champlain, like the Great Lakes or any other of our significant water bodies, is there's significant legacy pollutants there. They are from policies or practices that happened before regulations existed. We didn't have wastewater control systems that Jeff or Bob Fisher ran until the 60s. We didn't have good water supply um, treatment facilities until around that time too in the 70s. Clean Water Act didn't happen until 72. Um, during post-war, rail cars of phosphorus were shipped to Vermont at ridiculously cheap prices with all agriculture agencies saying, use this, it's for the better good. And so we have literally millions of tons of pre-existing load that we have to deal with. So um, present polluters, I think we're ratcheting down on. Past pollution, it's all of us and we bear the brunt of it. And the challenge is it's more expensive today and we'll get even more expensive tomorrow. And it's uh, public trust resources yeah. and it's our kids that are gonna bear the brunt of it again. So I, uh, I think that's the context for I share your frustration, but Lake Champlain has this legacy that um, is multi-generational and the present polluters are us also. Okay. Well, that's a little bit of a down note to end on, but <laughs> on the other hand, it is a sobering task. We know it. And um, part of the earlier conversation about getting data, I mean, I think we all feel the responsibility, fiduciary responsibility to spend taxpayer dollars well. And that means knowing what we're getting for the money we're investing. Um, so well, I, uh, 
unless there's anyone else who wants to make a closing remark, I would just say thank you, everyone on the committee, for your for your year round and years round work on this, and helping us um, better understand in the state house what's going on out in the waters of the state. That's very helpful. Look forward to following up with you on some of the more detailed questions that came up today. Uh, thank you. Thank and you very, very thank much you. for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.